Fellow Kukrudites, we were elected to fix the problems and I'm glad to report that we are fixing the problems. The Ghana city has been classified as the worst of African currencies with the worst sport returns tracked by Bloomberg. This government is under intense pressure to return to the IMF for a bailout in the wake of harsh economic times. We will not go to the IMF today, we will not go to IMF tomorrow, and we are not going as long as the NPP remains in power. As my colleague um, Deputy Minister said, we are not going to the IMF. Whatever we do, we are not. If because of political pride and the rest of them we don't want to go, that is a different thing altogether. Once the government, on our behalf, whether I like it or not, says we are not going to the IMF, then my position changes. Then show us alternative. The good thing though is that it does show that being an IMF program imposes more discipline. Because this government itself argues that all the way until early 2019, they were doing brilliant. What that means is that they were doing brilliant during the IMF program. December 2016 came with a thunderbolt. It was time for the electrics to decide. The elections were fought on the turf of the economy. After eight years of power, the National Democratic Congress, led by John Dramani Mahama, suffered a huge shock. The party lost the national election by a huge margin. A new messiah, Nana Adudankwa Ekufo Ado, was ushered into office to perform the badly needed surgical operation on the Ghanaian economy. By the power vested in me as the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, and the returning officer for the presidential election, it is my duty and my privilege to declare Nana Adudankwa Akufuado as the president-elect of the Republic of Ghana. I, I, Nana Adudankwa Akufuado. There was a new breath of hope. A new team was to steer the economic affairs of the country. In fact, many believed that with Dr. Baumia in the economic management seat, Ghana's economy would never slip back into coma. Fellow Kukrudites, we were elected to fix the problems and I'm glad to report that we are fixing the problems and we are putting in place the policies that will drive the economic transformation of this country. In his first State of the Nation address on the 21st of February, 2017, President Ekufuado described Ghana's economy as one which was in a bad way. According to the Ghana Statistical Service, the country closed 2016 with an inflation rate of 15.4%. The Bank of Ghana pegged the country's debt stock at 122.6 billion Ghana cities with a debt-to-GDP ratio of 73.3%. The city had lost 9.7% of its value against the dollar. Interest rate on loans had ballooned to 10.8 billion CDs, and international reserves could cover just 2.8 months of imports, resulting in 3.4% of GDP growth rate. By the end of 2019, Ghana's macroeconomic indicators had seen massive improvement, attracting awards for his stellar performance. We wanted to recognize him with this prestigious award from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. It is an award that we don't give lightly, we take seriously, and we do it out of respect to what the President has done in Ghana. So please give him a round of applause. March 2020, the unexpected happened. The COVID-19 put spokes in the wheels of Ghana's economic trajectory. A lockdown, a term that was alien to the country, surfaced and placed a temporary halt on economic activities. Pursuant to the powers granted the President of the Republic under the Imposition of Restrictions Act 
2020 Act 1012. Restrictions on movement of persons in the Greater Accra Metropolitan Area, Gama, and the Greater Kumasi Metropolitan Area and contiguous districts for a period of two weeks, subject to review. President Ekufuado announcing the lockdown that halted many economic activities. To help keep the economy in motion, Ghana received both in kind and in cash from various sources, including a 5.9 billion CD credit facility from the IMF. The devastation and impact of the COVID-19 pandemic was huge. Deputy Minister of Finance, Dr. John Kuma, recounts the impact of the pandemic. COVID-19 was an exceptional um, pandemic that affected economies all over the world. So uh, Ghana is not the only country that got affected. If you check in 2019, the economy was mm. at its peak. Yeah. And we had done a lot of borrowing and it, the investment, the returns of those investments was better going to show in 2020. But unfortunately, COVID struck and the economy retracted. In fact, uh, it grew by only 0.5%. So what it means is that all the investment you have done and expecting its impact mm. in the 2020 uh, in terms of the growth or the economic performance of the country, you lost all that opportunity. In the heat of the pandemic in 2020, Ghana went to the polls and President Ekufuado was re-elected. <laughs> Unlike his first term, almost all key economic indicators had taken a nosedive in President Ekufuado's second term. The atmosphere in Ghana was charged and filled with complaints from every corner of the country. And by 2022, the cost of living had become unbearable. Because the fuel is high, so I'm doing a double work now. Five cities, you get wache and gare, and we manage to give you macaroni small. Business are really bleeding. Uh, some of the business are intensive care. By the first quarter of 2022, Inflation had crept from a single digit to 19.4%. In March, the city was on a free fall against the U.S. greenback and international reserves began dwindling. International rating agencies including Fitch and Moody's all dropped ratings on Ghana's credit worthiness. The nation was thrown out of the international capital market. As foreign liquidity began to dry up, exposing the weakness in Ghana's economic fundamentals. The only option was for Ghana to turn to the IMF for a bailout package. Professor Bopin sounded the alarm bells. He said going to the IMF was inescapable. I personally don't think that um, the IMF is a long-term so uh, solution to our problems. And the reason I say so is that we've been there 16, 17 times. Is that okay? And practically every three years and some few months, we've had to go to the IMF and all of that. But as we always say, what takes us to the IMF has to do with the fundamentals. And as we, as we sit right now, everything points to that. The calls to register for an IMF bailout became intense. After seeing Article 4, after seeing the COVID report, Article 4 2019 and the COVID report, and seeing the fiscal gap which is there, that was when I expressed the view that maybe it's time for us to go. That's how far back to go to the fund because it's not just about COVID. But we got all the COVID money, as I said already, and we could have used it to make a correction. Because the COVID money we got for ECF was 913 or so you know, million US dollars. Yeah, you're talking about 6 billion. Why was it not sufficient to do the correction? Something fundamentally wrong. Government's position was very simple. No IMF program. It has so much hope in using domestic means to turn the nation's economic fortunes around. We are not going to the IMF. Whatever we do, we are not. The consequences are there. We are a proud nation. We have the resources. We have the capacity. Don't let anybody tell you. In the raging storm, Finance Minister Ken Oforiata was insistent that government wouldn't subscribe to an IMF program. If because of political pride and the rest of them we don't want to go, that is a different thing altogether. It should not be our first resort. 
but we have not demonstrated that on our own we'll be able to impose a fiscal consolidation that would elicit the appropriate response from duty bearers as perhaps we have seen in 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 our relationship with the fund if we could do that why not for 60 something years of independence we can't keep going to the imf anytime we go to the imf i feel that we, we i i feel we've lost something right as as a sovereign country and the rest of them but imf doesn't impose itself on any country through countries' own actions and inactions, mismanagement of the economy, and the rest of them takes them to, to the IMF. So if we arrive at that point where homegrown solution has probably failed to, 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 to get at the same result, we'll do that. I believe that in 2014, when the government made a call to the IMF, it wasn't because it was their first resort, right? Yeah, the fundamentals did it so. My position has always been, once the government, on our behalf, whether I like it or not, says we are not going to the IMF, then my position changes. Then show us the alternative. IMF cannot save us, right? Because we've done IMF 16 times, getting to 17 times now. We are, we are on an IMF program for the best part of this government until recently, right? Up to the end of 2018, this government was on an IMF program. The good thing, though, in that respect, is that it does show that being an IMF program imposes more discipline. Because this government itself argues that all the way until early 2019, they were doing brilliant. What that means is that they were doing brilliant during the IMF program. That's an important point. So to make the case as if IMF is a problem is strange. If you did IMF from 2017 all the way to uh, December, end of December 2018, and the economy was doing well as per your own analysis, then what is the argument anymore about IMF being a poison or a toxic element that you need to avoid? The government's attitude tends to be that, oh, we don't need IMF because IMF is bad, in a way. They don't say it directly, but it implies that it's bad. And I'm arguing that from 2017 January, when they came into power, to 2018 December, that's two years, they were running an IMF program. Now, when you ask them about their financial track record and their performance, the government likes to say that oh, until COVID hit, we're doing brilliant. And I'm saying that if that track record is one you are so proud of, you did that under an IMF program. Despite government's insistence, the honorary vice president of Imani Africa, Bright Simmons, was hopeful government's best bet was seeking an IMF support. But beyond the political ego, was there any historical experience? preventing government from approaching the IMF for liquidity support. During 2018, when you were, that, you were under an IMF program, you were growing at 8.3%, right? You were doing fantastically well on inflation. Exchange rate was stable, right? We did not see massive unemployment based on some IMF restrictions or whatever it is that you've been calling it. You did the IMF program for two years. We know these are some of the reasons why you don't like the IMF. In April 2018, the government was forced to acknowledge that it lied to the IMF about its external arrears and was forced to apologize, right? You have to write to the managing director of the IMF and apologize that somehow you forgot whatever, somebody, some data was not there, blah, 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 blah. Of course, that is why you don't like the IMF, because that extra discipline, that extra scrutiny may not be something that is to your liking, but we have to look beyond your ego and think about a country. Yes, the IMF will insist that you disclose the data. You will not be able to play the games that you play with us here, where you say something, where is the data, you refuse to disclose the data. They will insist. So that might not be very pleasant for managers in the government, but that does not mean that it's against the national interest. We should distinguish between IMF program elements that may not benefit Ghana, of which nowadays there are not that many because you yourself have to come up with a proposal and you yourself have to negotiate it. And then IMF program elements that may not benefit the government ministers and officials that may be responsible for designing and implementing it. I think the two are not on the same scale. And while the IMF will not transform Ghana, while the IMF will not change Ghana's fortunes dramatically, our argument is that it's no worse from the things that are already happening. While government stood by its decision not to subscribe to the IMF program, Ghana's economic situation began to worsen 
and by the end of the second quarter of 2022, the country had added close to 42 billion CDs to its debt portfolio. Inflation had more than doubled compared to the rate in January 2022. Ghana's reserves were fast drying up and downgrades kept hitting government in the face. The health of the country's key economic indicators showed it was impossible to forge forward without support from the Britain Woods Institution IMF. After months of refusal, government finally made a big U-turn. It announced its intention to seek an IMF program blaming it on the pandemic and the brewing tensions between Russia and Ukraine. Deputy Finance Minister John Kuma makes a strong case on why government beat a hasty retreat. Let me say that uh, this is not the first time Ghana is going to the IMF and um, every time that we have been out of an IMF program, it has been our hope that uh, we will not be in a position to return to the fund. Nevertheless, we are members of the fund. I mean, we are part of the uh, global membership of the mm -hmm. IMF. So uh, even when you don't have a program with a fund every year, you still have to go and engage in Article 4 reviews, and, uh, reviews and engagements with a fund. So uh, I think that uh, when it becomes impossible, when it becomes very difficult, such as external factors, such as what we are talking about, which is beyond your control, mm -hmm then you have to look up to the fund for a program that will come in to restore some of the confidence and economic indicators to bring relief to your economy. So, uh, yes, even though initially we had indicated we were not going to the fund, we've got into a point where some of the domestic expectations that we had, for instance, the E-Levy mm. that we introduced, the domestic, especially our fiscal programs like E-Levy, didn't give us the expected returns and we all know how ye levy was fought in parliament and the propaganda against it it actually impacted on its implementation mm -hmm. immediately and once we were not getting the revenues we will not watch to run down the economy we had to take the critical decisions to restore uh, the economy and that is why eventually his excellency the president uh, directed that we should engage with the fund uh, engaging with the fund gives you a number of advantages. First of all, it helps to restore confidence uh, in, your, in your economy. It gives comfort also to investors who have brought their funds into your economy mm -hmm. to believe that uh, you may not default or you are on the right trajectory mm -hmm. in terms of uh, your uh, economic um, policies and programs. So we needed that to restore the confidence uh, and then also to be able to bring our debt to sustainable levels. So these were some of the key factors that uh, eventually had to force us to re-engage with mm -hmm. the fund. By the end of the second quarter, skyrocketing inflation compelled the central bank to ramp up monetary policy rate from 14.5% in January to 19% in June 2022. Depreciation of the city against the dollar also quickened the pace of economic decline and added more pressure to the country's debt burden. Debt levels were so high that many financial experts predicted default for Ghana. Ghana's uh, debt stock, uh, let me say, have been influenced about, by about four key factors. One is the energy sector um, debt accumulation that um, we created then the banking sector cleanup exercise that we carried uh, which was about 25 billion and then we are talking about COVID-19 expenses that came and then lately the depreciation of the currency mm. uh, we know that much of us of our debt stock is in, uh, in foreign, foreign currency, currency yes. so anytime there's depreciation of the CD even though you have not borrowed money the debt stock will show incre increases. But former finance minister Seth Tepe maintains government has no business blaming the economic mess on the COVID-19 pandemic. The point is that you can go and refer to the Article 4, 2019. There was a fiscal gap before COVID. Yeah. That's point number one. So we're saying don't put everything on COVID. 
come up clean. Secondly, the current government is the only government. Yes, COVID was severe, no question about it. Severer. But doesn't, if you minimize somebody's crisis, you wouldn't prepare for the next crisis, which is why, as we sit here, we are not prepared for the next crisis because the sinking fund, you saw it is down, will be down to zero. The stabilization fund is just a skeleton of itself. And during COVID, remember, we fell on part of the savings that we had made, mm. right? You know, to assist in COVID, right? Uh, we left 250 million US dollars as from part of the borrowing in the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund, together with VAT that flowed, you know, what happened to those, those funds. So you see the buffers that were left yeah. for the government together with the affairs, right? But the other point, apart from the two points, buffers and then also, you know, um, the uh, three oil fields and the buffers. This is the administration, I would say, which had a crisis and had approximately six million billion US dollars from IMF, COVID, soft loan, IMF, SDR, World Bank, 600 million, Bank of Ghana, 1.7 billion, you can count it, nearly Korea six. Korea too. Korea, yes, China, PPEs and everything, to resolve COVID. So six so, billion. So, so you mean the cost was already catered for using Precisely, because the cost was, was disclosed during the, for the COVID loan was 3% of GDP. And what we are talking about is more than 3% of GDP, because it's about half of what JRE brings. Yeah. And we just saw GRE brings in about, if you take it, it brings in 15, you know, percent of GDP, you know, which is half of it. So it means you got about seven, half of it mm. to resolve COVID. You know, so why continue blaming COVID? And how many African countries borrowed one billion for COVID? And how many African countries went into their own coffers, coffers to take 250 million US dollars? Now it's almost 400 million from the stabilization fund, which was bequeathed to tackle COVID. Mm. You see, so we are not belittling COVID. We are only saying a certain candidness is required. Should be more open. Yes, more open as to the causes. Because the main cause is expenditure. Expenditure is bloated, including some of the very ambitious things that we want to do for political reasons. Bright Simmons, on the other hand, believes COVID-19 rather left a footprint of blessings for the country. The government has tried to create the impression that how much we spent was so much that it affected our finances in every other way. But if you look at, you know, overall our social assistance spending versus countries like, you know, Senegal, Rwanda, uh, even the average in, West, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we spend less. And then when you look at how we responded to COVID, like the free water, the free electricity and the rest, even that, we are behind the likes of Kenya, Benin, Senegal, and the rest. We are higher than the average in West Africa, but we are not the highest in emerging markets, and we are lower than several of our competitor uh, economies who are doing less bad than we are. So we cannot really blame COVID. You look at how much more Senegal spent, for instance. If COVID spending was the issue, Senegal would have much more of a challenge. And then when you look at the impact, you know, how much of our economic growth was actually shaved off by COVID, you see that we are there, look at us, we are top there. Look at our relative effects, 0.2%. Look at countries like Namibia. Look at countries like Myanmar. Look at um, um, countries that have you know, massive shrinking, like Mauritius and the rest that are like major tourist um, countries. You know. In delivering the March-anticipated 2023 budget, Finance Minister Ken Oforiata confirmed the obvious. He officially unmasked the nature of Ghana's debt portfolio. According to him, Ghana was at a high risk of debt distress and the debt levels were unsustainable. Debt exchange program. Mr. Speaker, the debt sustainability analysis based on the macroeconomic outlook has been conducted by the Minister of Finance. It analyzes the country's capacity to finance its policy objectives and service its debts. The current debt sustainability analysis conducted reveals that Ghana is now considered to be in high risk of debt distress. Unlike our 16th enrollment in 2015, Ghana's unsustainable debt position 
was certainly a huge obstacle in obtaining an IMF deal. This means a lot of conditions must be met. According to the fund, in cases where the country's debt is assessed as unsustainable, the IMF is precluded from providing financing unless the member takes steps to restore debt sustainability, including seeking a debt restructuring from its creditors. IMF's message was very simple, restructure your debt or no bailout package. Ghana was out of the eurobond market and IMF looked like the only option. No more foreign grants and at this point, debt restructuring looked inevitable.